Luke chapter 22, please. Luke chapter 22. Strangely, the Lord led upon my heart to continue this topic, actually. So the, I was very surprised on uh, how the Lord uh, was able to use the other sermon that I preached to you about six sins committed in Gethsemane concerning reaction. So there were some people, from what I've heard, has received a tremendous blessing. The Lord uh, burdened my heart. He seems to keep leading me to keep preaching on this topic. So I will expound on that a little bit more concerning reactions. In this passage, it's the same passage we read last time. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's about to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Judas Iscariot is about to reveal and turn over his master. The disciples, they misunderstood the scenario. They did things their own ways to defend Jesus. And you know the result turned out to be a bloody mess in Gethsemane. And the reason why is because one person did the wrong reaction. The other person saw that and reacted wrongly to that. And it caused a chain of events of different people reacting to one another wrongly, which turned into a big bloody mess. As I've told you before, I strongly believe what changes our history, one of the most powerful things that you can learn is reactions. If you study reactions intensely, it will change your whole life. And people who can master reactions can actually, believe it or not, control the world, in my opinion. It's that powerful. If you don't think so, then all you have to do is just be a bad example. You don't have to do anything. Just act like a bad example, and you'd be surprised how many people would react to that okay. from the way you acted. See, you don't really have to deliberately do anything. Reactions is very powerful from what you do, from what you say. All right, we're going to look at Luke chapter 22, and then we'll look at verse 44. Luke chapter 22, and we'll look at verse 44. Uh, 45, excuse me, 45. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. I've shown you the richness and certain gleanings that we can learn of reactions here. We saw six wrong reactions in the previous sermon that I gave to you. But these sins or reactions would not happen had they not had something unconscious in them that caused them to do the reaction. In other words, what you have to understand is that a lot of our reactions, a lot of things that we do, is because something that is swimming inside our unconscious minds. These unconscious factors that are within us are powerful, strong effects that will make us do wrong things. For example, there are people who suffered a traumatic experience of probably family abuse from, their pre, uh, from many years ago. And because of that, it caused them to have a wrong reaction of being paranoid of different people, paranoid of what's going on within their own families, and it causes unhealthy relationships with their own children and their own spouse. But those people don't realize that. The reason why they don't realize that is because of an unconscious thing that caused them to do those wrong things on their families. And that unconscious thing 
was caused because of a family trauma from way back then. What I like to do is to expose these unconscious roots. These unconscious roots are eight unconscious mistakes. They are very powerful influences. They dictate everything we say and do. So I would like to expose these eight unconscious mistakes in Gethsemane, and that will be my title. Father, <coughs> will you fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood? Help me to preach what you want me to preach. Please make it minister and bless your people, Lord, for right now uh, I'm a mess. I can do nothing. I cannot deliver it right, and I need you. I confess that fully, Father. Use me now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, verse 45, verse 45, the Bible says, And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he got up from prayer, he found his disciples sleeping on the job. Why? They were very tired. And that's one unconscious mistake. That's the first unconscious mistake is tiredness. Why is it an unconscious mistake? Because I cannot blatantly call it sin. When we get tired, there are reasons why, and those are the reasons that we use to slow down in our spiritual duties. And it's not a sin. If you get tired, I mean, what are you going to do? You can't help it. You get tired, so you can't do it. If you get so exhausted from going through sleepless nights, it's not like you sinned if you're unable to read your Bible or pray or miss out one church service that day. That's what we're thinking in our minds, right? It would be a lot more different if we thought it to be sin, though, right? Now, that's not something that I can tell you, obviously. But see, if you set the spiritual standard high on yourself and you call things sin as they are rather than as a reason a reasonable excuse, then you could see a lot more changes in your life. That's the reason why people are unable to pastor well. Parents are unable to lead their children well. And that's the reason why people are in this area are failing in their jobs and businesses and the government leaders. Why? They all think that we're all... Tr I'm, I am really trying my best, but I, I'm just limited in power. I'm just too tired and etc. So... That kind of excuse has turned into a way where we can't really tell which one is sin or not. That's what's going to turn into if you don't keep track on yourself. If you keep using the excuse, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, you might be committing blatant sins that you won't know are blatant sins. That's the dangerous thing of that unconscious root of tiredness. But, you know, Jesus Christ, he was more tired than those disciples. Why? Because at verse 44, the Bible says, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. You've done that? Have you sweated drops of blood? If not, can't you pray like Jesus prayed if you're supposed to be a follower of Jesus Christ? See, I know that we go through trials, we go through sufferings, and I don't know what you're going through, and yours is probably greater than mine, or mine is greater than yours, and there's an understandable reason why that trial affects your Bible reading, your prayer life, your church attendance, and that's why some people perhaps are unable to go to church today even, because they're going through a suffering and a trial, and we have to pray for them. We have to encourage them. We have to love them. We have to understand them. But if you're not careful and I'm not careful, then it unconsciously affects us where we will use every trial as our excuse to slow down in our spiritual duty for God and to even backslide, but we don't know we're backsliding. That's good. Amen. Amen. Did you sweat drops of blood? Then why can't you go on for Jesus? Okay. Did you sweat drops of blood? Then why did you skip passing out a track to that person? Why did you skip your Bible reading? Why did you skip your spiritual duty? Because I'm too tired, I'm too tired. Jesus was more tired than you, my friend. He suffered more than what you suffered. 
and you can give me your greatest suffering right here and I'll cry with you and I'll empathize with you and I won't judge you, but there is the judge at the judgment seat of Christ who suffered more than you did and he will have the right to determine and judge you if you really did your best and if your tiredness is a legitimate excuse. Haven't you studied Christians throughout history who are more tired than we were? I mean, if you're in America, if you're in American comfort, and if you got your consumer demands met, I mean, I'm sure that you're too tired to serve God when those martyrs, they had to hide in caves, walk through many miles, their lives were at stake, and their children and their spouse could be tortured for the name of Jesus Christ just to attend church. See, our standards have dropped. That's the bottom line. I'm not saying that people who aren't able to come today because of some legitimate trial they're going through are sinning against God. I can never say that to them. Because why? Because I don't know. But only you and God will know. And it's important that you do keep track of that rather than keep using tiredness as your reason and your excuse. Because if you're not careful, then you will sin eventually without knowing it. And that's why it's an unconscious thing. That's why it's extremely dangerous. Verse 46, verse 46. The Bible says, And said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Jesus said, if you don't want to fall and mess up into temptation, you need to wake up. You need to pray. It's that simple. But you know why I think a lot of us still enter into temptation? Enter into situations where we give wrong reactions, make wrong decisions, say the wrong things? Not all of them is sin. Remember that. Remember that I told you wrong reactions that you gave is not all the time sin. Like I gave the example of tiredness. Times when you skip your spiritual duty because of exhaustion and tiredness doesn't mean you sin. Actually, maybe God would prefer that you skipped it that day so you can recover your health. But see, we turn that into our pillow where now we're committing sin and backsliding without realizing it, if that made any sense to you. See, that's an unconscious thing you have to keep track of. Another thing that I noticed right here, like I mentioned before about wrong decisions, wrong mistakes that people make, is because Jesus told them if you would only rise and pray, then you would know and you not enter into the wrong scenarios. So the reason why you enter into wrong scenarios is because you don't rise and pray. In other words, you're not awake. You're not awake. What does that mean? That means you don't know. A lot of mistakes that we make, didn't you know it's not because you deliberately sinned against God, because you deliberately disobey him and say, God, I know uh, I'm going to sin against you? No, that's not why you give wrong reactions. That's why you didn't say the wrong things. A lot of them are just by accident because you didn't know. Isn't it very true? Sometimes, didn't you see within your relationships, for example, with your loved one, you said and did things that were wrong, but you didn't mean to. But the spouse took it the wrong way. And then you realize later on, oh man, I was immature. I, okay, I'll fix that. Why? Because you didn't know. When you came to this church, weren't there sins that you didn't know were sins until the preacher mentioned it? Doctrines that you didn't know were wrong until the preacher mentioned it? See, you have to understand, a lot of these wrong things that we commit can be done by things we don't know. Ignorance. You know one thing I hate about this Bay Area? Quite often, uh, the people who labor with me will hear me say this a few times, but the reason why I hate this Bay Area uh, is because of that culture it produced. You might say, what do you mean by that, preacher? I noticed that uh, businesses and then people, when they do their work, their job, and then taking care of things, they're too lax here. 
They're very, very lax here. And you wonder why businesses are so slow to answer your phone calls and hospitals and government offices, they just keep, keep you on a wait list and a wait list and a wait list. And then you all get frustrated and nothing gets the job done. I remember my in-laws from Korea when we were going through shopping in San Francisco at a gift shop. And then the guy asked if he wanted uh, my father-in-law's item to be wrapped up. My father-in-law said yes. And then that guy took that item and took his sweet time to wrap up that gift. I mean, there was a long line of people behind my father-in-law. They were waiting, but that guy, he just didn't know. He was just focusing on his job and taking his sweet time. And then my father-in-law was saying in Korean, man, San Francisco's pretty slow compared to Korea, isn't it? <laughs> I remember telling my wife when my wife was like waiting two hours in a line and then she was like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And me, because I got so used to this culture, this area, I was like, honey, you got to work on your patience. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought she was wrong with the Lord. I said, honey, you got to work on your patience. That's how people are over here. Then when I went to Korea yeah. and Australia and nearly every other part of the world besides San Francisco, yeah. I was like, yeah. you're right. They're too slow over here. <laughs> what are they doing? These idiots, you know, with these long lines. They should send more workers. Here are three guys talking in an office, joking it out, when there's like a line of hundreds of people that they should be ministering to. What are they doing? You know why? It's not. It's because of the culture they're used to living in. They're too lax. I notice that especially when pastoring here. When pastoring here, in this Bay Area... Because I'm used to being homeschooled, I'm used to being disciplined by my family, and I guess our Korean nationality kind of helps out as well, I'm very used to being like that, like get going. But then when I started pastoring here, I realized, wow, I didn't know that it doesn't work like that. People with different backgrounds, different cultures. But think about this. I'm not saying that my way of doing things is right because I've learned that from my culture, my ways of doing things, I had to learn to slow down and understand people. And this is my point. The same is true of you who are of a different culture where you need to get going. What's my point? You and I can't just stay in our cultural zones and expect church business to progress smoothly. I've always seen tensions and problems in churches when we're running businesses. You know why? Because people's personalities and backgrounds and cultures are different. And they need to learn to work together. They need to change their cultural, their personal way of doing things. And think about others and minister to them. Why? Because it can turn into sin if you're not careful thinking about the other person and ministering to them. It means that you don't love them enough that you're willing to change some things. You wonder why your marriage life, you're still fighting? Is it because of personality differences, cultural differences? That's our excuse, but it can turn into sin if we keep using it as our excuse. But see, we don't know that. Why? That's how we're used to living normally. The way you behave, act, talk, whether it's because it's your personality or your, or your culture, it's your normal way of living, isn't it? Did you wake up and smell the coffee a bit and realize that, hey, my normal way of talking, my normal behavior is not edifying? It's making my church suffer. It's making my relationship suffer with my spouse, with my children. It's making, yeah, this is, this is important because it'll even affect your work, your business. Your money is on this. People always complain about their bosses, but you know what? The thing is, is that sometimes you have to think about that other boss's personality, culture, background. And the bosses, the reason why they're unfair to you is because they're only thinking about their personality, their background. 
And you wonder why the world's a big mess? What's that then? That's the sin of selfishness, self-centeredness. If you're not careful, if you want to keep living the way you normally do things according to your personality, your culture. So how do you not even enter into that, those sinful things if you rised up and prayed to begin with? Okay. See, what does that mean? You're awake. Light is given to you. So now you see, now you're not in ignorance. Now you know. And has there not been sometimes light shed from God on your life, but you rejected that light because you want to keep doing the way you do things? And you wonder why your family life is breaking apart, your loving relationship with your spouse is not working, and you wonder why your, you're not, your fellowship is not sweet in this church? You got to see the light that God gives to you, and when he's telling you, hey, you got to change the way you talk right here, you got to change the way you behave right here, I know to you it's a normal way of doing things, but that's not it to other people. You have to be aware. And that verse says pray, right? What if you prayed? Even better. But see, you don't even pray. You don't even pray about, Lord, what I said, what I did, was it pleasing to you? Did it edify people? Was I in the wrong, Lord? Was that person right? You don't pray stuff like that. You just go about normally doing your everyday thing, and if something doesn't go right, with your normal routine, you get mad and upset about it. Verse 47. Verse 47. The Bible says, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude. And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Now, we know that Judas, he knew full well he understood fully what he was doing when he kissed Jesus Christ. I'm going to betray him, and I know that I turned against my master. I'm going to hand him over to the Jews. But what about, notice right here, that multitude, right? You see that? Behold a multitude. I wonder how many of them really understood and knew, like Judas did, that this is the Messiah. This is... Jesus Christ, that Judas is actually committing treason against God. No, they, don't, they weren't thinking like that. If I was a soldier, and if I was one of them going along, what would, what would I think? Like everybody, that this guy's a criminal that I'm arresting. It's not like they full knew well about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ or had that much knowledge like Judas did. Judas was three and a half years with Jesus. He knew what he was doing. He believed he was the Messiah. And then at the end, he hung himself and didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but more as an innocent man, he said. But see, these soldiers didn't think like that at all. They didn't know about all that. They just understood that the person that they're about to arrest is like any other prisoner, like every other day they've arrested. They misunderstood. What if they understood about Jesus, really? What if they understood that Jesus Christ is not a criminal? He says who he is. I wonder if they were discipled like Judas was discipled. They would have understood more and probably not make that mistake, perhaps. Quite often, the reason why we make mistakes is because we don't understand either. We didn't have that luxury. We didn't have that time to understand full well about some things. There were many times that we misunderstood things, that we misunderstood things. The evidence is given when we look at verse 50. When we look at verse 50 and when we look at verse 52, 50 and 52. Notice right here, and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Notice that Peter, whose ear he cut off, servant of the high priest. Not the high priest, but the servant. Now, why is that important? 
the importance is that the high priest religious leaders they understood full well what they were doing with jesus they were jealous of him the bible says they turned him over for envy but do you think these servants and soldiers that accompany those religious leaders they were like the same jealousy like them or they're just doing their job i mean the evidence is further given when we look at verse 52 then jesus said unto the servants of the high priest is that what it said no he said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him see not the rest of the servants but to those guys why because they understood what they were doing was wrong be come out as against a thief with swords and staves when i was daily with you in the temple you stretched forth no hands against me but this is your hour and the power of darkness see jesus was rebuking those guys not the servants because he knew that those guys the chief priests the captains and the elders they knew full well what they were doing they understood so they knew what they were doing was wrong they understood what they were doing was wrong and they knew it but the servants they didn't think like that they were just following orders doing their job they think jesus is like any other common prisoner that they're arresting okay. yet still that did not justify what those servants did right that still did not justify those servants arresting jesus christ treating him like a common criminal that still gave them no right to do that well i didn't understood like my chief priest and elder it's that person's fault for what they did to jesus you can't blame me it's not my fault it doesn't change the fact that you're the ones that touched jesus christ put the bonds and the chains on his hands and you dragged him along like a common criminal it doesn't change that fact what's the point the point is still you can make bad decisions you can commit blatantly wrong actions without fully understanding you can misunderstand stuff and still make bad and really bad mistakes you ever seen two spirit-filled preachers that god has mightily used and praise the lord jesus christ they were a blessing to me and then all of a sudden you later find out why aren't they getting along why aren't they getting along you find out later from somebody else oh they're not they're fighting over this you ever wondered who was right and who was wrong I mean, if they're both spirit-filled, how can they not get along? That doesn't make sense. If God uses both of them, why do they still make the mistake of not getting along in unity? Because of misunderstanding. They think they understand what's going on. And then because of that, a fight comes out. You've seen that in church? You've seen that with your family? Oh, wait till you get married. Okay. And don't tell me you never misunderstood the spouse. Uh, you know how arguments always go? I understand and know why you said that and did that. That's the reason why I have the right to argue this against you. Okay. Why? Because you know their behavior pattern. You've seen them all that time. And then that gives you legitimacy to tell yourself i understand so i'm right about this i know i'm right and then later on you found out you know there was something i misunderstood i should have toned it down right there i should have thought about that a little more but it's too late you already said the wrong words out of your mouth to the person you loved and now the damage is done where that loved one now thinks a little bit more negatively of you You know why bad things big consequences still happen because of misunderstanding verse 48 here's another unconscious mistake verse 48 notice right here but jesus said unto judas betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss I like how Jesus asked that question. Notice a huge, big consequence. Betray, right? That's a big thing. That's a serious thing, right? It's not a light thing. That's serious. But from something so small with a kiss. A kiss that greets people 
That's what Judas did. He didn't punch Jesus. He didn't say, hey, that's the traitor. Take him. And he didn't do anything like that. He respected him by greeting him with a kiss. See, it's just a fault, you know. It's not something major. But then Jesus pointed out with that question, something serious and big still happened. Betrayal from a little fault of yours. One thing I learn about us human beings is the reason why we keep making uh, bad messes that we have to later on clean up and we re regret doing is because the things that we do, we don't see it as sin, but as little faults, little mistakes. And they're not a big deal. I mean, let's take this for example, okay? Let's say that you're assigned a duty in the church and then you showed up late. Did you sin? Did you commit the sin of murder? No. Let's say that you were slow in your job, okay? You didn't really keep up the process and you're just too slow and lagging behind in things done in the church. Is that a sin? Did you commit a grave sin? Let's say you didn't really put your 100% best like you would do in a serious exam or in your business or workplace when you're doing a church duty compared to a work duty or school duty. Is that a serious sin? Let's say you get distracted when you're doing your job. You get distracted and then you're not paying attention to what you're supposed to do and then you made some sloppy mistakes. Is that a serious sin? What if you're not doing well in your duty in church and someone has to cover for you? Someone has to clean up your mistake. Is that a serious sin? No, of course not. It's not a sin. It's just a fault. It's just a minor thing that everyone does. But why, why is it that maybe, I didn't say that it is, but maybe we should take those things more seriously? Because if you're not careful, that turns into more and more getting used to doing things. And maybe that might affect your real job if you're not careful. That might affect your relationship with your family if you're not careful. And you try coming late over there, you try slowing things down, and then you try getting distracted, not paying much attention to them. Let's see if your family life and then your job place, they'll really like you. You know what happens with carelessness if you're not careful? If you're, that used, if you're used to faults like that, that kind of carelessness, it could turn into a big consequence where, let's talk about a car accident. Is a car accident, when you get into a car accident and then you crash into a car and there are little kids over there, it's not like that you deliberately did it. It's not like, hey, I'm going to kill these kids. No. It's a fault. By not being careful, paying, paying attention, looking, taking driving seriously. Why? Because you're just so used to driving the way you drive. What if you honestly drove your best? You honestly drove your best, and then there was a careless thing there, and it happens to a lot of us. I know that, all right? It happened to me too. And then you crash into a car. And God forbid, what if there were little kids in there and they died? Now, what are you going to do after that? You're going to say, oh, it's not my fault. You know, uh, I mean, it's not like I attempted to kill your kids. No, no, you're going to feel guilty still because a serious Big consequence happened, not from a deliberate sin you are trying to do, but from a fault. What's my point? If you keep leaving faults alone, they might lead to serious consequences one day. That's why this sermon's important. Because a lot of the serious mistakes that we made in our life, I believe, is not because we consciously know them. It's not because we're sinning. It's because these are just unconscious mistakes we keep leaving alone. Okay. 
Verse 49, verse 49. The Bible says, when they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? All right. Now, what's that question? They're saying, God, because they saw what would follow, right? Mark those words. They saw what would follow. What? They're going to lay their hands, on, their hands on Jesus Christ. And they even told the Lord, hey, Lord, shall we smite with the sword? That means I have a good reason, God, to take out the sword and kill them because they're about to lay their hands on you. I mean, look, if uh, it's, just, it's just sincere and reality that if you see someone and you're on the job and you carried a gun in your pocket and you saw someone put their hands on their gun and all of a sudden take it out and then he was right in front of you, you know what the instinct is? Bam! But then, the thing is, that's human instinct because we're made to defend ourselves. It's not like you're sinning that, hey, I want to kill that guy. No, it's an unconscious thing, see that? Mm -hmm. Unconscious reflex that we have to be careful of. And there are people who did make the mistake of shooting the wrong person. See, big serious consequences can happen from unconscious reflexes if we're not careful. Why? Because the unconscious reflex here that I'm aiming at is legitimizing serious situations. Legitimizing your excuses. Now, let me give a legitimate excuse, all right? Perhaps the most legitimate excuse. I'm sick, I can't come to church. Yeah, legitimate. Not a sin, remember that, okay? Please, I don't want people to misunderstand from this preaching that I'm telling you all that you're sinning if you made these mistakes. No, what I'm trying to tell you is I hope you just don't keep leaving them hanging. That you keep track of them this time and start questioning, is this right or is this wrong? But see, we don't do that because we just keep leaving them hanging, right? You don't want to make that mistake. That's an unconscious reflex, unconscious instinct, unconscious mistake we keep making. It's time that we wake up and pay attention and see, is this right or is this wrong, right? You got to do it that way this time. So let's say that you're too sick, you can't come to church. Let's say work day happens and you can't go to church. That's legitimate. You can't go to church. What are you going to do? Suffer in your workplace? What are you going to do? deteriorate your health more and you can't go to church more days after that? It's legitimate. So, if you can't go to church, you can't go to church. But if you're not careful, see? Right. What happens? Right. You'll keep legitimizing. Okay. If you, like I said, that unconscious thing, legitimizing excuses, if you leave that thing alone rather than questioning it, Rather than turning that over to the Lord in prayer, if you just keep leaving that thing hanging, it'll become a constant thing you'll keep doing. And if you keep leaving that unconscious reflex alone about legitimizing excuses, what's going to happen is then your Bible reading now suffers, your church attendance has been many years now, and then now you're even yielding into sin and you don't know why, but I'll tell you why. It's because you keep legitimizing the things that you do. When you keep legitimizing your excuses, then it will become valid, real excuses to you to keep skipping your spiritual duty and eventually sin. You know why people sin? People sin because they legitimize it. If you're not careful... And don't keep track of those unconscious mistakes. Like I told you before, it can even turn into sin eventually if you're not careful. You might say, but I can't help it. I'm too busy. I can't help it. I'm too sick. Okay, then let's talk about real life. You think that's going to work on your spouse and your kids? You wonder why the family don't like you now? Kids don't like you? You wonder why... Uh, the spouses end up in divorce because they think that 
you always use your job and you love your job more than me. What, you, you want your kids to say that about you? Health. Oh, I'm too sick that I can't do this and that and that. <laughs> With your spouse watching you, kids watching you, they can see when you're using that as an excuse. Didn't you know people who suffer cancer too? This is mean, but this is true, okay? And I'm not beating down people who suffer cancer. We are praying for them, amen? Right. But didn't you know, if you're not careful, that people who suffer cancer will use that as a legitimate excuse to keep burdening their family and loved ones. Why? Because it's a legitimate excuse. But pretty soon... Your loved ones are going to catch on and they know that you're just using that to take advantage of them. Why is this serious? Because we all do that mistake. You know why there's so much chaos in our area? Everybody's legitimizing their woes and sorrows, aren't they? Always the minority car, minority car, minority car. Is it legitimate, their sufferings? Sure. But who can tell when they're using it to take advantage of other people now. Now you know what you've done? You've taken advantage of your loved ones because you're so used to taking advantage of the church, the church's kindness, and God's mercy on your life. All right, the next one is verse 50. Verse 50. As I... Hate to say, all right, and I quite often say, is that just like my last sermon on reactions, it's heavy, right? It's very heavy, and it can be very hard. Why? Because this is something we're so used to living. And it's not something like you committed a serious crime. But we, I really believe why we have broken churches, broken homes, and even broken mental health is because we let these unconscious, slippery things take advantage of us. If we don't fix those things, we'll remain broken home, a broken life, and a broken family relationship, and a broken church. In verse 50, notice right here, the Bible says, And one of them smote the servant of the high priest, and cut off his right ear. Now, Peter... Let's not go hard on him. You cut off somebody's ear. No, no, let's not be hard on him, all right? I love Jesus Christ. And in fact, he was Jesus' number one disciple. You know that? That means he really works hard for the Lord. He really does his best for the Lord. Here he is. He's trying to do his best for Jesus, but he's just so weak that he can't even cut off a guy's head off properly. That's what he was trying to go for. I'm going to cut off your head, but he just cuts off his ear. Why? Because he's weak. <laughs> but he's just doing his best. You can't blame the guy. He's just doing his best. He loves Jesus Christ. Now, um, when you parent kids, don't you try your best for them? Yeah. Don't tell me you never made a mistake, right? Okay. But you did your best. You really did your best. And guess what? We all still make mistakes. Why? This is the unconscious thing that you really want to keep track of. Because no matter how many times I pray and preach and teach, guess what? There are still some mistakes I made in my preaching and teaching. That's inevitable. That's reality. Why? It's called the flesh is weak. Because the flesh is so weak. God understands that. That's why he uses weak, imperfect vessels nevertheless for his glory, right? But it doesn't change the fact what kind of vessels are he's using. Imperfect weak. If you're not careful, when we keep leaving these imperfect weak vessels as our excuse that God can still use me anyway then you'll never perfect yourself more. You'll never fix those flaws of yours. And if you're not careful, those things can turn into sin eventually. And the greatest evidence is your parenting of your children. 
You know why? Because you're so used to the parenting the way you parent, way you parent, and then you wonder why your kids still mess up. I mean, I've even been to liberal classes. I really believe that even die-hard left-wingers, generally everybody, or not everybody, but most people generally, when they're a parent, they want to give the best to their child. But why is it they're still broken homes? Why is it still kid hate their parents? Why is it that kids can still find mistakes in parents and parents can still make mistakes in spite of the best that they give? Because there's a reality we don't want to accept. We're weak and in, we're imperfect. No matter how much you pray up and no matter how much you put forth your best effort. That's inevitable. Because we're weak. Pastoring, I made mistakes. I prayed up. I got advice from everybody. I read the word. And even I would pray in the middle of the conversation. But I still messed up when I talked to people including counseling. People who leave the church, they left because of a mistake that I made. And I pulled out my heart and did everything that I could. But still, I make mistakes. So, what's the lesson to be learned? The lesson to be learned is that I can't, I can't tell you that never make a mistake again because no matter how much you do your best, you'll mess up. But the lesson to be learned is that don't let it keep sitting there. And don't let weakness be your excuse to, well, I can't help it, you know. And then you just leave it alone and keep making more imperfect decisions. Keep making more mistakes. You know how serious the mistake is? Cutting off a person's ear if you're not careful one day. Like I told you, the greatest evidence is when you pastor people and when you parent children. Nobody likes that. How, why, is it, why does it have to be that serious? Because that's reality. That's flesh. That's how imperfect, that's how sinful that the flesh and the world system is. That even if you're a really hard doing your best person, there's still serious consequences. That's why we can't let weakness be our excuse to let those things lie. we got to work hard to do our best and let Jesus clean up our mess. Claim Romans 8, 28, when Jesus picks up that ear of the, of the servant and patches it back. Why? Because Jesus knew that Peter's just doing this out of love for me. Peter's just doing his best. He's just weak. It's not like he's deliberately sinning. Don't worry, Peter. I got your back. I'll clean up your mess. So that's all you could do is just keep working on your imperfections and trusting the Lord to clean it up and live life in peace. But if you leave those mistakes hanging and keep claiming Romans 8, 28, hey, man, when you reap the serious consequences, don't claim Romans 8, 28. Verse 52 through 53, 50 through, 52 through 53. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which were come to him, Be come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, he stretched forth no hands against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Jesus said, Day in, day out, like a habit, he was preaching in the temple. And Jesus knew full well by that habitual act he did day in and day out, it would hurt him and it would hurt and other people could get hurt eventually. It's true. If Jesus never preached on that temple, called out the Sanhedrin, that bloody mess would not have happened in the Garden of Gethsemane to begin with. But Jesus, see, he knew that by preaching in the temple, that habit he did day in and day out, eventually that bloody scene in Gethsemane would happen. So he was ready for that. He was ready to clean up Peter's mess. He was ready to forgive Peter when he denied him. He was ready to love his disciples anyways when they abandoned him. He was willing to let those people take him and crucify him. He was fully ready for that. But I wonder if you know as well 
I wonder by a habitual act you're used to doing every day, you know full well there could be a serious consequence or hurt that can be afflicted upon you and others. If you do, then you're more at peace. If you're not, then when those troubles happen to you, no wonder you get stressed out. And you wonder if I sinned against God. Jesus didn't. What do you do habitually every day? Have you ever thought there's a serious consequence eventually that's going to come out of that? You should know. You know what helped me a lot more? Things that I'm habitually doing in church. If I know the consequence that would follow after that, it helps me when that consequence happens, I'm ready and prepared to handle that and to accept it. A lot of people don't think about that. What's your habit in what you say to others? How you treat others? Right. What you think, what you feel. Haven't you thought about if you're so used to doing that day in and day out that there's going to be a serious price to pay eventually for that? I know the serious price to pay to pastor in the Bay Area. <laughs> the serious price to pay is, don't expect, Gene, you're going to have a flourishing ministry. So that helped me to soldier on and not quit. But guess what? I'm still weak in the flesh and I still whine. But at least I thought about the serious consequence before. That kind of helped me. That cushioned it. How about you? What's your habit? The way that uh, you do things in the church, you operate in your workplace, your relationships with others. The way that you're used to doing things, your daily habits, is it going to hurt somebody one day? Is it going to hurt yourself one day? Are you aware of that? Are you fully prepared for the consequence? No wonder people whine and suffering all the time. I witness to my family and they persecute me. Well, you should obviously know that. God already told you that. If you have a habit of soul winning, expect opposition. If you have a habit of sinning, expect depression. If you have a habit of talking the way you talk and you offended somebody, well, tough. You should have known that. Verse 61, verse 61. Let me give, uh, I, I forgot to give an example right here, but let me give an example to better explain. Let's say that you have a personality of uh, being very nice and kind to people. Nothing can go wrong with that, right? Uh, <laughs> You know what's going to happen? Then people are going to think you're the number one person who understands their feelings. Yeah. And they're going to dump every emotional turmoil on you. And they don't know it, but they are taking advantage of you. And that's a big, ugly mess. So guess what? The person who dumps the problem unconsciously did it. And the person who has a habit of being too nice and understanding of people unconsciously made the mistake too. And there's a big mess that happens from two people who unconsciously made a mistake. Why? Because of they don't keep track with their habits. One person has a habit of dumping his or her problems and the other person has a habit of receiving problems. And expect an ugly mess after that. Verse 54, verse 54. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. You know what I believe? I believe that Peter would not have followed afar off if he remembered what Jesus told him before. He forgot something. Look at verse 61, 61. The Bible says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter what? Remembered. That means he forgot something. So when he was following Jesus afar off out of fear, I wonder if he remembered things may have turned out different. If he really remembered what Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times. If he remembered it, if he believed it, he probably would not have followed him afar off and made that mistake of denying three times. Or... Maybe he would be mentally prepared 
and not deny the Lord three times. But he made the serious mistake of denying Christ because he forgot. An unconscious tendency. Yeah, come on. Why everybody keeps making mistakes is you forgot. You don't think that doesn't have serious consequences? Try doing that in your workplace. Oh, I forgot. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Coworkers and bosses won't keep forgiving you. Okay. Try that with your husband, your wife. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I forgot. Try doing that with your kids. Okay. That's a good it was your kid's birthday. Oh, I for you for what? For God? You better shut your mouth, man. <laughs> what happens? What happens is when we use forgetfulness as our legitimate excuse and we make mistakes that are not sin, we still commit serious consequences at the end if we're not careful. You know what I believe? I even believe a lot of temptations and sins we would have overcome if we really remembered everything we heard from the preacher. I really believe we would take in suffering better if we really remembered everything we heard from the teaching of the Word of God. And you know what? You don't remind yourself. You just keep forgetting and you go by your feelings, don't you? Now, um, I have a question. It's just a little bit of common sense. Let's say you truly fear sinning against God, all right? Like you take sin really seriously. You take sin so seriously that the unconscious things that you do, everything you say and do, you might go, oh man, I wonder if it's sin or not. That's what's going to happen if you fear sinning against God seriously. Think about it. People who are traumatized or paranoid or who have a phobia or a fear of something, a lot of times what they say, think, and do they're going to ponder about that fear. And that fear deters them from saying, thinking, feeling something a lot of times. That's what phobia, that's what fear does. Fear, what it does is it's so ingrained in you that even, even you, when you say or do things, it's going to still travel along with you. I wonder why we can't do that with sin. Imagine that kind of a fear on sinning against God and it sticks with you every time you say, think, feel, and do something. Don't you think you might be conscious of the unconscious things that you do and you might catch those things that could become sin? You know what your problem is? Which is why I hate this culture so much. We're too relaxed. We're too comfortable. We don't take sin seriously. We don't fear the holiness of God. If we did that, wouldn't our behavior change dramatically after this? Our work, our performance effort, our love for each other, our duties for God, how we handle suffering and temptation would dramatically improve. Exodus 20, 20, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God is come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that he sin not. Ecclesiastes 8.12 Though a sinner do evil a hundred times and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God which fear before him. Are you that sinner who's used to doing a hundred times and you don't even realize you committed a hundred sins? But imagine if you start to carry that fear of the Lord, if you had that fear with you. And I'm not talking about an unhealthy phobia, but a healthy level of fear that constantly is carried with you where you take sin seriously, fearing to sin against the holy God seriously. Wouldn't your life dramatically change for the better? Because why? We lost our fear of God that we have not become conscious of the things that we do. And that's why we do a lot of things unconsciously 
and we make so many serious mistakes and eventually serious sins. Do you know what's more scary than that? I don't know if you're scared, but I would if I were you. Do you know how scary it is to never fear sinning against God? Do you know how scary that is? Is that how you've been living your life? Imagine never fearing sinning against God. That's the most horrifying thing ever. I wonder how great your fear then will be at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's find our fear. Every head bowing, every eye shut.